All right. In the newsletter this week, we told everybody that we're starting a new series on the book of James. Has anyone read the book of James this week in preparation? A couple of people did. A couple of people didn't get the newsletter. Hey, the newsletter is fantastic. It's a great source of information. But we're diving into the book of James, and we're going to re- um, go through this. And, and every time that we do a series that's based on a book, I encourage people to try and read through it as many times as you can to get the context of it, to understand what's happening, to pick up passages and phrases and different bits and pieces that are in there that maybe you wouldn't have noticed before because I think repetition really helps us to understand things. So we're calling this series, James, Living Out Your Faith. Now, James is just a relatively short book in the New Testament. It's only 108 verses. It takes probably about... 10 minutes to read through it. So I think you can find 10 minutes. I mean, we waste more than 10 minutes on Instagram. I mean, just, all right, everyone, you can go to screen time on your iPhone right now and just check how much time you spend on stuff that doesn't matter. It's convicting. It really is. But let's read. We're going to read James chapter 1. We're going to, we're going to park ourselves in this passage today. James 1, 1 to 15. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Can it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds? For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and that steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing." If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and let the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, it flowers, falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each pursuit, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We just thank you for this morning, this passage of scripture, this new book that we're diving into. We pray that you would illuminate your word to us line by line, word by word, as we walk through this together, that you would help us to see what we couldn't see before, or maybe we've never looked for before. We pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Did any of you think that I was just going to keep going and read the whole book? You're like going, oh, he's getting, this is going on for a bit here. Pastor Andrew is not reading a short scripture. He's just diving straight in. No, I just want to set a little bit of the background and the scene for the book, just sort of talk a little bit about who James was and, and why, we call, um, why, it's, why it's in the Bible, why it's there, and what is it, who's it written to and all of that kind of stuff. But the first thing we need to understand is um, who is James? Which James is it? There's four James in the New Testament who are listed, and And it's kind of a little bit ambiguous because he doesn't really identify himself apart from using that word, which actually, and this is going to blow people's mind a little bit, doesn't even mean James. His name's actually Jacob. And it was a translation thing that happened um, early on in the text, in in sort of the Greek and the Gentile translations. They translated the word for Jacob into the word Jacob. James, and that's the thing that has consisted for so long. So a lot of people actually refer to the book of James as the book of Jacob, um, because that's what his name actually means, and it's referred to. So it's part of his Jewish history, because there is no other James apart from that. It's a translation 
that has taken place between the Old and the New Testaments, and now Jacob has become James. Um, so which one of the Jameses, I'm going to call it James because otherwise we're just going to get confused. Who is he talking about this Jacob? There's no book of Jacob. What are you, Pastor Andrew? Are you Catholic or something? No, I'm not. We're not making up new books of the Bible. Um, but we're going to refer to him, and that's, I just wanted to get that out there right at the start so that you can understand that there's actually more to the word than maybe what you see on the surface. Right? And it's worth diving into. There's so much richness that you can get out of it in understanding things about the books that you read, not just what's written in the books that you read. You've got to dive beneath the surface. So which one of the Jameses wrote the book? There's four. Was it James the Apostle? Um, well, probably not James the Apostle because he was killed by Herod Agrippa before the book was slated to be written in around about you know, 50 to AD 50 to 60. But James was killed in AD 44. So you know, the, the Apostle James, who's listed, I talked about a lot, it wasn't him. He, he died before it was written, so it couldn't have been James. And then you've got another James who's the son of Alphaeus. He's referred to as James the Younger. Now, he's also in the 12, the, the main 12, but he's not considered to have been authoritarian enough to be able to write a book to all the churches. So people have ruled him out as well as being one of the, uh, the people who could have written this book. And then there's also Judas' father, James. Now, just to clarify, we're talking about the good Judas, not the bad Judas. But his father was James, so could it have been him that wrote the book? Um, and there's so many people and characters in the Bible, and you read about their name, and you go, and that might have been the only time they were mentioned, and you think, why are they there? What, what, is there some significance to why they're there? But they, it wasn't him, but they mentioned that only really mentioned that that James, who's the father of Judas, basically to distinguish between the two Judases, the good Judas and the bad Judas. Um, we don't want to listen to the bad Judas at all. So this leaves us with the last James that's recorded in the New Testament, and it's James, the brother of Jesus. He's widely considered by scholars to have been the one who wrote the book, um, and people refer to him as maybe the half-brother of Jesus or the cousin of Jesus. I believe that he is Jesus' brother, um, and he's the most likely author of this book. And it's an interesting thing to note about James is that he did not even believe in Jesus while Jesus' earthly ministry was happening. He was kind of opposed. Because it says in John chapter 7, verse 5, for even, not even his brothers believed him. Not even his brothers believed him. But just James, just this James is considered to have had a transition, had a revelation of who Jesus is at the cross. Um, and it says in Galatians 1.9, he's considered amongst the apostles. And it says, as we've... That's in the wrong scripture altogether. That's got no relevance to this at all. Moving right along. <laughs> Pastors need to do um, like quality control on their sermons and sense checks. I don't know what that was. How did that one get in there? <laughs> it's an embarrassing pastor moment. It's okay. All right. So this is the James. James is considered to be among the apostles. It says it in, in the scriptures that James, the brother of Jesus, is now considered to be among the apostles um, who's teaching and um, preaching in the church. And, and who is he writing to? Who is the book of James written to? He's writing primarily, and this is, this is important for us to understand, he's writing this book primarily to Jewish Christians, Jewish believers, those who have been raised in the same faith, the same level, the same way that he has throughout his life, but to them everywhere. All right, so understanding a little bit of context, the Jews were persecuted heavily, and we... we we talk about them, he's preaching, he's written this book to the Jews in the dispersion, the dispersion or the scattering everywhere. In James 1.1, 1, 1, this letter is from James, a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I am writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad, greetings. I love that. Maybe we should start every sermon with Andrew, uh, pastor of Harvest Church to all of the congregation in Horsham and in Nil, greetings. We should, I think that would be fun. The other words, 
other, so we can sort of see from the New Living Translation, it says scattered abroad. People have been scattered abroad. Generally, he's writing to those who have been scattered across all nations. The church was persecuted by non-believing Jews, the ruling class, and they spread to every country around. As we can sort of see in the book of Acts, we talked about a little while ago that the day of Pentecost, they all were coming back into Jerusalem from all the countries around that they had been. The dispersion is this book is written, this letter was written to Jewish Christians and believers everywhere. And it's not designed to refute or address a particular problem as we might find in like Paul's epistles. Paul writes letters to go, hey, you, stop doing that. Do this instead. James is more encouraging to people to stand fast and hold firm in the, pace of, in, the, in the face of whatever trials may come that we have a hope in Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. Um, it's, right, it's bringing clarity to a way of living for Christians. Um, James 1, 2 to 4, and this is kind of going to be our, our, some of the basis of this message today. It says, Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Everyone say steadfastness. steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Oh, who wants to be perfect? I mean, we all try. We, we try to, to, to strive for perfection. It's not something that we can reach. But James says that it is something that we can attain because of what Jesus has done for us, being steadfast. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. He also continues in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. I think there's three things that we're going to talk about today from these passages are about the test, the trial, the, the test, the, the things that happen to us through our faith that, that we need to remain steadfast for. And the first thing is, is that we need to understand that our faith is going to be tested. Whoever here has ever felt like your faith is being tested? It's rhetorical. You don't have to put up your hand. It wasn't a salvation altar call. But we go through these moments and these challenges and, and sometimes these trials and we feel like, oh, we're, we're being tested. Our, God's testing my faith. Or um, we, we blame God for everything. We either blame God or the devil. We don't usually blame ourselves um, when things seem to not be going quite right. But we, we, we go through things. And maybe we go through things like sickness or we go through things like poverty or we go through things like adversity or persecution and we go, oh, I'm being tested. My faith is being tested to the limits and, and I can't stand. So, and this is just a part of being a Christian. We don't, we don't preach. So I don't preach. You might have heard it preached. I don't, I don't do this. That come to Jesus and all of your problems will be solved and everything will be rosy and it'll just be like tulips and unicorns and you'll be skipping through the daisies and everything's going to be lovely and then you'll have all the money that you'll ever needed and you'll be able to pay all of the bills and you'll be able to be super generous and if you come to Jesus and he's just going to fix everything. Has anyone ever subscribed to that kind of theology? No, that's not a good one to put your hand up to. <laughs> we don't preach that. What we preach is that Christians go through suffering, the same as everybody else. The, problem, the, the difference is, is that we don't go through suffering alone, is that we have a heavenly Father who sent Jesus to the cross, who dies on our sins, and we can have a relationship with him. And now we have someone who walks with us through every trial of life. 1 Peter 6, 7 says, In this you rejoice. Who here rejoices when you've got trials or persecution or Something's going wrong. Oh, man, I've got this sickness. Awesome. Let's rejoice. I've been tested. Oh, all of the people at work are persecuting me because I'm a Christian. Awesome. Come on. We don't do that. Let's be real for a second. We go, oh, man, I'm so miserable. I've been persecuted. Oh, it's just, oh. God, the, the devil's coming to get me. You know, right? Just rejoice, for now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved in various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's three different types of trials 
that we face. Okay, three different types of trials. The first one is cause and effect trials. If you're writing down notes, cause and effect trials. This is kind of like reaping and sowing or our disobedience. We go through trials that are of our own making. We go through trials where we disobeyed, we paid the consequence, and then sometimes we go, but I'm just being tested. I've got a trial. I'm going, well, no, you need to come and repent and get right before God and hand it back to him. That's the first kind of test that we face. The second one is spiritual trials. And these ones are a little bit different. They, they happen and they test our faith. Phil, stop causing trouble. <laughs> oh, it's Liz. I believe that. Oh, I do. Spiritual trials are another thing that we go through. And these are sometimes when we feel persecuted for standing firm in our beliefs, standing firm in our faith, when everything the world says comes another way and does something different. Oh, no, you can't believe that anymore. We, 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 that's not our culture. We, 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 we don't believe that. We believe this instead. And so, no, no. When we stand firm in our faith, when we actually hold on to the Word of God and we are unmovable and steadfast in it, the world's going to hate us. I'm just going to tell you that. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if that's sort of burst anyone's bubble, but we're, we're not called to be liked by the world. A lot of churches have got it wrong and they just want to be liked by everybody. They want, to be, they want to be accepted by everyone. They don't want to offend anybody. But know that the message of the gospel is offensive to those who don't believe and don't know Jesus. It's just part and parcel of the thing. It says in John 15, 20, Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And that's what we call spiritual trials, is that when we get a persecution or something comes along of that nature. And then you've got this third category, which are spiritually mysterious trials. Things just happen. Things that are most difficult to accept and express joy in. Sometimes it might be sickness. I think about when, I th- when I think about this kind of trial, I think about Job. Job was a man who was steadfast and faithful and gave glory to God. And, you know, this is Job's actually the oldest book in the Bible, um, not Genesis. It's, Job is actually the oldest written book in the Bible. And it's this story about how the devil approaches God and says, Well, Job's your favorite, but if you give him to me, I'll make mincemeat of him, and then he's going to curse you. And God's got faith in Job. He's steadfast, he's rock solid. And he goes through all of these trials, these things. And it's not like God didn't test him. He allowed for tests to happen in that situation. You know, Job, his friends were were a bit weird. And his friends were convinced that Job was facing the trials because of hidden sin in his life, which is cause and effect kind of trials. And his wife was certain that it was God's fault. God's testing you, but God doesn't test us that way. But even at the conclusion of the book of Job, he doesn't even understand the reason for his suffering. But what we can see, God gives Job the solution that is proper for all three of these forms of trials that we face, whether it's our fault, whether it's being persecuted, or whether it is just something mysterious that we don't really understand the reason for, God gives us the answer for every form of trial. And the solution is that to commit his utter trust and faith in God. To acknowledge the mystery of God's ways and not being our ways and committed himself to his faithful God who is always to be trusted. There is an answer when you don't understand. There is an answer when you're going, I'm not sure why I'm being tested this way. I'm not sure why this is happening to me. I'm not sure why. The answer is to put our trust and our faith in God, come what may. Whatever the solution is. You know, I've shared this so many times. I feel like I just need to share it for somebody's remembrance again today, is that my dad was a great preacher. Uh, He was traveling around the world and influencing hundreds of thousands of people all the time he would go and speak at pastors conferences and seminars and 
I still have so many people come up to me today and say, your dad was one of the greatest Christian influences in my life. And he had this impact on people. But he got sick. He came back from overseas one day and he, he was brilliant. Like he had this photographic memory. He never made a mistake with his words. And mum had noticed him preaching and he, he, he couldn't, he, he couldn't remember Bible characters' names, which is something that he'd never done. And she said, you need to take Dad to the doctor. And I took him. I was with him. The doctor took one look at him and, and um, asked him some questions. He said, you need to go straight for get an MRI and a CAT scan and all of these kind of things. And basically the next day, Dad was you know, in hospital with this aggressive brain tumour. Um, and so we went down the process of... I don't know why. I'm just taking my time. Is that okay? We went down the process of faith, but going to the doctor, but faith and going to the doctor and surgery and more surgery and going to the doctor and treatment and chemo and radiation and all of this kind of stuff. And, you know, we had people fly in. This is, this is the impact. People would fly in from the States. People would fly in from Europe. People would fly in from all around Australia to come into our house and to lay hands on Dad and to pray over him, and to believe in faith. And I, I, I can remember this so distinctly. I knew in my spirit that he would be healed. I'm like, we, we walked out of one of these prayer meetings, and then I'll tell you what, these are fiery prayer meetings. And we walked out of one of these prayer meetings, and I'm going, my dad's, uh, I've got no doubt, my dad's going to be healed. And it wasn't that long later that he passed away. I'm like... God, what's going on? What, what's happening? I, I knew in my heart that Dad would be healed and he's not healed. My brother explained it to me quite perfectly. Uh, he said, um, you don't get it. <laughs> good, thanks for your bedside manner, brother. <laughs> it's good. Nathan, if you're watching, love you. Uh, but he said this to me and it was really unique. He says, you don't understand. He says, Dad just was healed. I'm like, oh. It just wasn't the way that I wanted it. And this is the problem. When we go through trials, we actually prescribe to God the way that we actually want things to turn out. And then we go, well, if it doesn't happen that way, then maybe God wasn't in it. No, 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 maybe God was in it all the way along, and we just need to trust him, come what may. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, I know that my God is able, and he will rescue us from the flames, but even if he doesn't, I will not bow down. You could preach that. Anyway, that's not even part of my message. Testing produces patience and steadfastness. There's this word for testing, dokominion. It's the Greek word dokominion, and it means to, like refining fire to gauge or test for impurities. The encyclopedia, I looked up an encyclopedia. If you've, does that exist anymore? Or do we just use Wikipedia? I actually looked up an encyclopedia this week. It wasn't a paper copy. It was on the internet still, so it still has the same weight. But a fire assay, a fire assay is also known as a copulation. It's considered the most precise method of testing whether there's impurities in gold. When you actually put it through the fire. Um, the encyclopedia defined it as a separation of gold or silver from impurities by melting the impure metal in a couple, which is a flat or porous dish made of a refractory, high temperature resistant material, and then directing a blast of hot air on it in a special furnace. The problem with this method is that it is destructive because it must melt the piece in order to determine the gold's value. Have you ever felt like you're being melted? You're being tested to the point where there's nothing of you left. That's when God does his thing. Is that he actually strips away the impurities, the things that we need to get rid of, the things that we need to shed, and he melts it down. The thing is it's destructive because the piece of gold that you had before, the ingot or whatever, the, the, the block, I don't know, of gold, can't exist in that form anymore. We resist because we just want to stay the way that we are, and we're saying, God, just fix my problems. And he goes, okay, let's get in the fire. I can fix this. We can strip this away. No problem. I've got this sword and we're like, ah, isn't there another way that we can do this? Can you just sort of like maybe, 
just a little bit of sandpaper, something. I mean, everybody knows somebody with a sandpaper ministry, right? It's that irritation up and down. But the testing which God allows to take place in our lives is the place of our greatest spiritual significance. It's our faith where the tests come. All of these different types of trials, whether they're self-inflicted, whether they're persecution, something mysterious, they test our faith for the quality of, its, of our faith. Then they refine us. It says in Job 23.10, For he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. That sounds a lot like this whole process of copulation, the testing, the refining, the refiner's fire. Consider if we never went through trials. Everything was rosy. It's just gardens, sunshine. It's beautiful. It's like, what's a perfect temperature? About 25, 20, 20, depends on the person. I'm going to say 25 degrees, no wind, sunshine, green grass. Everything's just perfect. Perfect golf weather, right? Or on a... On, a, on, a, um, on, a, on every hole, it's a tailwind. That's, that's perfect golf weather. Um, but we, you know, what if we just went through life and we didn't face any trials and we didn't have the, the tools necessary and then we all of a sudden face trial? What's going to happen to us? We're going to crumble. We won't have the tools necessary to be able to deal with it. Trials produce resilience in our faith. There's two Greek words that, that James uses. I might not even get through one point of this message today. That's okay. Two Greek words. The word for steadfastness, which is hypomene, hypomene, and it means to stay under. Stay under. It's a submission word. It's being submitted to, but it's also staying under when you don't, when you when you can't. It's the being able to stand and to Keep standing. When you have done all to stand, to stand still, to continue to stand. Hypermena is steadfastness. It means you won't quit. And this is what trials build into us, the ability not to quit. I've got to tell you, I'm going to be honest. Honest past the moment. We went through some stuff in our previous churches. We went through some trials. We went through some persecution. We went through some self-inflicted stuff. And those trials produced in us a steadfastness, a rootedness, a depth. Can I tell you this? We've been through worse stuff here. But it doesn't seem like it is. We've been through some criticism. We've been through bits and pieces. We know it's there. And we know not everybody talks to us about it. We know you talk to other people about it. (laughs) But... It doesn't seem anywhere near as bad because our resilience has grown in our faith. We're stronger now than when we were before. We're not the same people because we've grown. Steadfast endurance, the power to withstand hardship or stress, especially the inward fortitude necessary. The second word is this word perfect. It says that steadfastness will produce and continue to work in you so that you might be perfect or complete. It's kind of funny because people in the Bible used to use words that meant the same thing consistently. So the words perfect and complete actually mean the same thing. It's this word teleos. It has been complete of its kind without defect or blemish. Essentially, what it's saying is that when you go through trials, that that produces a steadfastness, a solidness in your faith that then makes you mature. Maturity is not longevity. It 100% is not longevity. But maturity comes through being this process of being refined and being refined and being stripped away and being made complete without defect or blemish. James is saying here that you will have trials. He echoes Jesus perfectly when Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble or tribulation. You will have trials, but rejoice because they will produce in you a steadfast perseverance that helps to complete your faith and make it perfect. Who here is going through a trial right now? A couple of honest people. A couple of people not being so honest. It's all right. I go through trials all the time. 
Philippians 1.6, let me encourage you with this. And if the worship team want to come, I am not finishing this sermon today. <laughs> Philippians 1.6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Trials help us to grow. The more trials that we go through, the heavier the trials, the more it produces in us. The stronger that they get, the stronger that the trials come, the more it produces in us. Now, I may not look like it, but I have a gym in my house. <laughs> Do I just need to? No, I'll just leave that on. This kind of covers up the lack of muscles. The thing with weights is, is that if you wanted to produce muscle, you start off small. You don't just go straight to the gym and you go, give me the heaviest weights that you've got. You're going to do this. Something, this is stuck. Something broken with this machine. It, it, it doesn't work. I mean, we've got one of those, those home gyms where you, you sit down in the seat and you can, you can push it out and you can do these ones and you do the pull downs and stuff like that. And if you put it on the, the bottom level, I'm like going, it's broken. It doesn't work. It's, there's something wrong with it. It's, just, it's, 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 it's defective. But the thing is, the understanding is, is that, the, that as you progress, as you start on a low weight, you you progress to the next weight. You're going, when you start to find that weight a little bit too easy, you've either got to do one or two things. You've either got to do more reps or you've got to increase the weight or sometimes both. And then the more reps produces more gains. And the more gains produces more reps. And the more reps produces more gains. And the more trials produces more faith and the stronger faith. And the stronger faith Guess what? Produces more trials. Oh, hang on. That's not the news that I wanted to hear, Pastor Andrew. I was just kind of hoping that the stronger that my faith got, that the, t- the trials would go away. No. No money, my problems. It's the same kind of thing. If you have more faith or stronger faith or better quality faith, you know what? You are able to stand firm in the face of anything that comes. And I'm going to guarantee you this, that it will come. You will go through things and go, I did not wish, I would not wish this on my worst enemy. And you wouldn't. But God knows that you are able to stand and continue to stand and to stand still and to stand firm in the face of adversity. I don't know how to finish this now because I've still got two more points. That's all right. We won't finish. I think what we're going to do is this. I want us to stand. Stand to our feet. Thank you, Chloe. I don't want to do an altar call where people come down the front. and We're not going to do that today. But... I want, to, I want to encourage some people that, like James says, is that you, the trials that you face and the things that you walk through and the, and the sickness that maybe you've, 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 you're not sure why you've got it and you're like, you know, is this from God? Is from? No, it's just there. It, it's just something that we all walk through. And, and you're going, I'm being tested. I feel like my faith is shaking. I feel like sometimes it's breaking and and I don't know what to do about it. And God, sometimes it seems like you're a long way away from me in these moments. I want to tell you something. Is that He's not far at all. He's actually right there in the midst of every trial. He's the fourth person in the fire, in that refining fire, when it feels like everything's being blasted off us. It feels like everything's being melted away and stripped away. He's the fourth one in the fire. Talks about that with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That there was another person in the fire that they could see. 
going, hang on, we only threw three people in there, but there's four and they're not being burned. What's going on? He's the one who's in there with us. He walks with us. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. So when it feels like maybe, you know what, Lord, I'm not even sure if I can actually stand this anymore. I can't continue to keep going. Guess what? You can continue to keep going because of the strength that He puts in you. Your faith being tested, it actually produces steadfastness within you. That steadfastness produces (coughs) coughing (coughs) or perfection, completion within you. So this is what I want to do right now. Thank you. I want to have a drink of water. If you feel like you're being tested right now, and you just don't know what the answer is, maybe it's sickness, maybe it's some other struggle, maybe it's spiritual, you're feeling oppressed, you're feeling like defeated, you're feeling doubt, you're feeling like, I can't continue. I'm just not sure what to do. I'm I'm feeling flat all the time. What I want you to do is we're just going to close our eyes in this place, right across this place. Just give people privacy. If that's you, you're one of those kind of categories. You're going, I'm going through a test. I'm going through a trial. Whether it's my own fault or not, why don't you just lift up your hand? And we want to pray. God's going to see it. We're not going to ask people to come around. We're not going to ask people to lay hands on you. Yeah, all across this place. People walking through tiles and tests, fire. Yeah. Awesome. All right, why don't you put those hands down? I can see they're a really good mix. It's probably about half the congregation has actually had their hand up something. We don't try and diminish these things that happen. We don't try and go, well, you know what? You just got to get over it and suck it up and get on with it. That's not what we do. What we actually want to say to you is that if you're going through a trial, God's here for you but your church family is here for you too. But most of you don't come and tell us when you're going through trial. And we'd love for you to come and talk to us. That's what we're here for. We're here to care for you. We're here to love you. We're here to walk through the trials with you. But hey, let's pray right now for every single person who raised their hand. Father, you see every single situation. You know every fact. You know, every, every situation that somebody's in, whether it's their own fault, whether it's a sin issue, whether it's a disobedience issue, whether or not, Lord God, they're being persecuted, tested, whether it's a sickness, whether it's a, um, a financial issue or a relationship issue. Heavenly Father, right now, right across this room, I pray that you would bring wisdom into the situation. It says in the book of James that if you lack wisdom, wisdom, which is an answer for the testing, that if you lack wisdom to ask the Heavenly Father, and He will be generous with you. Father, I pray for answers to come through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit for every single person who has been suffering through trial. Lord, that you would let them know by the power of the Holy Spirit that they are not alone that they do not have to walk through the situations and the circumstances of life by themselves, but they walk with you and they walk with the church. And Father, we pray that over the next few weeks, we will see testimony after testimony after testimony of chains being broken of people's lives, of trials producing extreme good quality faith in people that they may learn how to stand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And there's one more group of people that I would like to pray for just here in this moment as we're about to close this service. Is that for anybody, maybe you going, Pastor Andrew, I hear what you're saying. Faith produces steadfastness, which produces perfection, which continues this loop of producing more faith. But I don't even know if I've actually started my journey with faith. You know what? To start your journey with faith requires submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ it says in the word of God that if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he is Lord you will be saved so I want to ask right here in this room and online and up in nil if that's you here in this place well every head's bowed and every eyes closed and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and to start that journey of faith with him I want, to, I want to invite you today to, to enter into that relationship with Him. So right here, while everyone's got their heads bowed and eyes closed, 
If that's you here in this place, maybe you're online or up in there, why don't you just slip up your hand? I'll see it. You can put it down. If there's anybody here this morning and you say, I want Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life and I want to serve Him with my life. If that's you here in this place, I want to pray a prayer for you. Is there anybody here this morning who wants to say yes to Jesus? Yes to Jesus. I didn't see any hands here, but maybe up in Neil or online, there may have been some. So this is what we're going to do. So we're going to pray this prayer of faith together, accepting Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Now, you might have done this a thousand times, a hundred times. Now, is something new going to happen when you pray this prayer again? No, but we're actually reconfirming our commitment to serving our Savior, Jesus Christ. So say this after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today, a sinner in need of a Savior. And I ask you to come into my heart, be my Lord, be my Savior. I acknowledge that on the third day, you rose from the dead to give me new life. Father, I pray that as I commit myself to you today, that you would have your way in me, that I would not be in charge anymore. And I hand over control to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, can we just thank God for everybody who's making a decision to follow Jesus today? So good. I don't know why I picked up my bottle of water because I'm about to pray the prayer of blessing over you. And then we're going to sing. We're singing this. What is it that we're singing? God, a beautiful name. Thank you, Alicia. I can't remember what songs are. Thank you, Rachel. Hey, uh, we're going to close the service right now. So why don't you, and even up, especially up in Neil, standing on your feet, let's, let's receive the blessing. Even though you're at home watching this online, receive the blessing I commit over you today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. God bless you, Harvest Church. Have a wonderful week. Come on.